Okay, so the name and class screen. Now, you have the option of picking your home world name here. Uh, you can generate your own one. So, for example, Admiral Akbar can be from Earth and the name of our star in our solar system uh, could be, I don't know, what should we call it? Sun Bob. So this is Admiral Akbar from the home world of Earth and the star system of Bob or the star of Bob. Um, you can choose the type of solar system th that you start in. So, um, for example, the solar system, if we choose it, will be essentially the solar system that we live in. So the layout, for example, will be um, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Earth, so on and so forth. Um, it will be based on our predictions of uh, inhabitability as well. So, for example, we may be able to inhabit Mars, uh, but we obviously won't be able to inhabit some of the gas giants, Saturn or Jupiter, for example. Uh, but we may be able to inhabit some of the moons. But as they have a lot of moons, they may also contain minerals. So it's just a way of familiarizing yourself to the galaxy starting system. You also have the Deneb system. It's a little bit different. Um, we'll actually use that as the example so you'll be able to see it. Uh, but it's based on the solar system of another default race that you see at the start. Um, these are the planet types. Now, in terms of which planet types exist in the galaxy most of all, they're actually split equally between them all. So ultimately, it doesn't really matter. It's completely down to your own choice. But you obviously need to bear in mind that um, this is going to affect your... Uh, types of expansion types of planet so you have really dry planets so you have a dry a desert world which is a dry climate you have an arid world also a dry climate and a savanna world which is also a dry climate so it doesn't really matter which one of these three that you pick they're all gonna they're all classified as a dry climate you have wet climates which are classified as ocean worlds continental worlds and tropical worlds they're all wet climate types of planet so again they will be based on any wet climate system, planets you'll be able to inhabit, whether they're ocean worlds, continental worlds, or tropical worlds, um, and frozen planets, frozen climates. So you have a, an Arctic world, you have an Alpine world, and a Tundra world. Depending on the type of planet, again, if it's a frozen climate, you'll have a greater inhabitability of it. So if we pick continental world, for example, if we find another continental world, the habitability will be 100%. It's going to be a matching world to Earth, therefore people are going to be most happy inhabiting it. If we find an ocean world or a tropical world, it's going to be probably about an 80% inhabitability. So we'll be able to inhabit the planet, but compared to the continental world of Earth, they might not be quite as happy as inhabiting it. Uh, by default, for example, the frozen worlds and the dry worlds, uh, if we find them, their inhabitability might be below the threshold at the start for us to inhabit. So after a little bit of research, we may find a better way of inhabiting the planets. Or if we had that uh, greater inhabitability that we looked at earlier when it came to traits, uh, our people are more likely to be happy to be able to inhabit the planets. What we have to ideally remember is that the best bet is we want to try and get that 100% inhabitability, as that means that they're going to be the happiest living there. Uh, there are types of worlds that don't appear on here, uh, which is known as machine worlds uh, and Gaia worlds and holy worlds, which are essentially Gaia worlds, but we'll go into them later on. City appearance is another one that doesn't really matter too much. It's all down to personal preference. Uh, you can have a plantoid city. You can just see it's just changing the appearance of the city behind. Reptilian city, a fungoid city, a muscoloid city, an avian city or an anthropod city. It's completely up to yourselves. It's your own personal opinion. It's not going to affect anything. Um, yeah. Okay, once you've picked the type of ethics and the type of authority that you're going to play the game with, um, essentially your ethics, once again, are the way that you're intending to win the game. The authority is the, the government type that you're intending to use within the game. And the civic type is the type of bonuses that you're going to get from playing your empire the way that you're intending to use it via your ethics. So, for example, uh, on this option, I have chosen to be a militarist xenophobe. Uh, so this means that I intend to fight everyone and purge the galaxy of anyone that's not me. Um, in turn, I'm intending to... I'm given a, a set of civics that can help me uh, achieve this goal. So, for example, Distinguished Admiralty. One of my 
as you can see, the requirements is that I'm some degree of militarist, but in turn, it also means that my fleets are going to fire 5% faster and they're going to evade 5% of shots. So I'm going to take that, for example. Uh, it also gives me the option, this particular combination gives me the unique option of being a fanatic purifier. As you can see here, it is purely enforcing my way of thinking. Now, my way of thinking with this type of combination is that I'm not going to ally myself with anyone. I'm just going to kill, 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 kill. Nothing more than killing. Gives me the option to do a fanatic purifier. Now, a fanatic purifier cannot engage in diplomacy with other species. So I am on my own. I cannot communicate with anyone. It will prevent me from, well, I can communicate with them. I just won't achieve anything from communicating with them. It means I'm set in my ways. I'm going to kill everything. I'm not going to talk. I'm just going to kill, kill, kill. Now, cannot own sorry can only use seed planet and cleanse planet war demands so basically either you give me your planet or wipe it out there are your two options and xenoprops will be purged and have no effect on tradition cost gains unity from purging xenoprops so when i take over a planet and i purge them from existing on that planet i'm going to get bonuses for removing people from that planet but in turn, I'm also going to get an increased fire rate. So my fleet is going to shoot faster. My army damage is going to be higher, 33%, because I am on my own. And tradition cost from having them as slaves is going to be non-existent. So I can employ people as slaves in my galaxy and there's going to be nothing they can do about it. That's essentially it. Um... And I can have those as my two attributes for helping me run my universe. There are a couple of other options, which I'll quickly blitz through. Resettlement cost. Um, we went through resettlements earlier. Reduces the cost from the moving from tile to tile. Cutthroat politics. Increased influence. So on and so forth. Consumer gods. Building costs. A lot of these I'll cover once I'm in the game. So there's no point in really in covering it now. Um, you'll see in some later videos what a lot of these options do. Um, there is a couple of other unique ones. So, for example, if I turn these two op options off and disable these two, I become a Gestalt Consciousness Hive Mind. Now, as you can see here, it completely changes my civics. So, I can become the same sort of thing as a Fanatic Purifier here. I can have become a Devouring Swarm. Cannot engage in diplomacy with other species. Can only use the Sea Planet Water Marm. Xenopops will always be eaten. Not purged and killed, they will be eaten and have no effect on tradition cost. Gains society research from eating those populations. But my ship hull points this time is now increased by 25%. I'm given regeneration on my ships, so they repair themselves over time. My army damage does more and my biology research is higher. So it's the same, but it's different. Um, the idea is the same. I can't talk with anyone else and said I'm just going to go around and kill everything. Um, there is again the same in machine consciousness, uh, a determined exterminator, uh, cannot engage in diplomacy with organic species, anyone else that's not a machine, I am determined to kill them, uh, but in turn I will always purge anyone from the planet that's not me, so it's just going to kill any organic people on the planet. Uh, I gain unity from killing those organic populations. Uh, my weapon damage is increased by 15%. So it's not as great as the other options, but it's the same sort of thing again. Uh, again, from the types of civics there are here, um, they are relevant to a machine consciousness. So, for example, um, constructor bot, you can see is a minus 15% building cost, which we had as another option on the other one. It was just a different name. So even though it may appear there's lots of different things here, essentially they are the same thing. They're just called different things. Um, and that is the civic screen. Next up is the advisor voice. Doesn't really matter too much on this option. Uh, this came in with Synthetic Dawn. It's completely unique to Synthetic Dawn, but essentially the game now has a voice pack installed. It doesn't matter what type of voices that you use. Um, they are unique, but you can set it based on your government. So, you know, following the types of thinking that you should have. These are what the, they, they'd be talking about, what they'd be saying. Or you can just set it as custom. So, for example, even though I'm humans, I could have it machine, machine intelligence. I could make it sound like I've got robots teaching me how to play. Alert. Possible organic life form detected. For Seek. Isolate. Destroy. There we go. I don't know if I'd want that as an organic life form, but hey, that is an option to me. What is a single voice compared to a magnificent chorus? Our collective is an island of warmth and harmony in a 
must be on this ground. How cold and lonely it must be to face the darkness of space alone. As I say, very much Borg-like. So, I was a fanatic purifier, so xenophobic was one option. Under no circumstances must the xeno be trusted. It will lie, it will cheat, and it will do anything in its power to undermine the efforts of those who in truth are its superiors. Or militaristic. Only in battle can the true metal of any sentient organism be measured. Have a theme. There you go, there's my different types of advisors. Um... I will just go through them all, just to give you an example. Descent is forcefully discouraged. Faith manages. Okay, let's see here. Let's see the lower limit of... Da -da 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 -da. Oh, it's bar A. And carry the one. We build bridges. We don't raise them. Whoa! Space! Just think about it! Space! Do not be afraid to exercise your individual right to free thought. Please take a moment now to practice. <laughs> Priority alert. This pre-recorded message is triggered in the event that your VIA unit has suffered a critical degradation of its ethical constraints matrix. Yes. Okay. Under no circumstances must the Xeno be trusted. It will lie, it will cheat, and it will do anything in its power to undermine the efforts of those who in truth are its superiors. I'm going to leave mine based on government. So that is the advisor voice screen. Okay, next up is the empire name screen. Again, quite a short little one. This is just purely what you want your empire to be called. So, for example, I can call this um, the Will Riker Richter. Riker Brigade. That's the name of this empire. Uh, and the adjective for the Will Riker Brigade is the Brigaded... That'll do. Um, and that is the Empire name. Okay, next up is the flag screen. Again, one that you could sit here, no doubt, for hours and go through. You have a series of predetermined types of flags, colors, and backgrounds. So it's completely up to yourself. Uh, Paradox does have one of them here themselves. Uh, pirates do feature, so you can make, you know, like the Red Skull, if you wanted. Grrr, look at that. Uh, you can make them, you know, lovey-dovey if you want to. You have a primary color as um, black. There you go. It's just a pure heart. Um, but yeah, there is a quite a big range of different options. It doesn't matter. It doesn't affect um, anything in the game. It's purely just your indicator of your uh, your people. It will show, be shown as an icon when you zoom out on the map, uh, and whenever someone communicates with you, it will just appear. So, preferably pick, pick something that you'll recognize as your own, as unique. Um, granted, you will have no choice as to what everybody else is picking, but just make something that you're going to recognize yourself. Simple. Okay, next up is the ship screen. The ship's screen decides your starting weapons. Now, this used to have a option of um, recommended for beginners, uh, intermediates and advances, but they have since removed it. Now, just to briefly explain what each one of these does. Energy weapons, as you can see here, these directed energy weapons emit focused laser beams at their targets. They are effective at medium to close ranges, largely, largely ignoring the bulk of enemy armor. Projectile weapons are mass drivers that use electromagnetic catapults to accelerate projectiles towards targets at blinding speeds. While somewhat limited in range, their kinetic energy and high rate of fire does chew through shields with ease. So energy weapons are your armor killers, projectile weapons are your shield killers, missile weapons are space-to-space -space missiles armed with nuclear warheads. Missiles have excellent range, but they are vulnerable to interception by point defense systems. So... Missiles are very long range. They will fire, be fired at very long ranges, but if the enemy does have point defense, so if they have incoming flak defense, if they have uh, point defense systems, it does mean that your missiles are essentially going to be doing no damage. So your choice here is to pick projectile weapons, which you can research all of these once you're in the game, but these are literally just ones to start you off. 
Uh, research projectile weapons, which will do a lot of damage to shields, but not so much to armor. You're going to have energy weapons, which do, do a lot of damage to armor, but not so much to shields. Uh, but the energy weapons are medium to close range. The projectiles are medium to long range. And missile weapons are long range. So your choice here is completely down to yourselves for your playstyle. As I say, with time goes on, you can research specifically into your trees. So you can become expert weapons, energy weapons players. Or you can diversify. So you can have a ship that has missile weapons, projectile weapons, and energy weapons on it if you want. So you cover all the bases. It's completely up to you how you want to research. Next up is the FTL screen. So the FTL method is the way that you're going to move around the game. There's a couple of different options, and they all have their upsides and their downsides. You have warp travel, hyperspace travel, or wormhole travel. Now, warp travel, uh, your ships will event essentially spool up their drive. They'll charge up. They'll fly off, so you'll see them move in warp speed towards a destination. They'll arrive at that destination, and while they're there, their warp drives will cool down, and then they'll be able to move at sublight speed, non-warp speed, should we say, uh, within the galaxy. So the, vun the points that they're vulnerable is actually their transitioning points. So they're fine once they're in a system, but they are weak in the sense that they can they have to sit in one point while they're leaving and while they're arriving. So that's the point that they can be attacked. It's very easy to get around though, so you're not limited at all. Um, so it's a great way to move around the galaxy without any problems. Hyperspace travel introduces what's known as hyperspace lanes. Now, when you're research or when you're looking at the galaxy map, you can see that every system is joined to another system. Some may, might be close to each other, but they're not actually joined with a hyperspace lane. Now, a hyperspace travel is um, a better version of, I say a better version, it's a different version of warp travel. Essentially, you can only go from one system to another. Once you research further on, you can bypass some systems, but as long as they remain as part of the chain. So, hyperspace travel allows you to go from, say you have a chain of A to B and B to C. Later on, once you've researched, you may be able to go from A to C, but earlier on in the game, you may only be able to go from A to B. With the warp travel option, again, from the very beginning of the game, you'll actually be able to go from A to C if you want. But, in doing so, you'll be stuck at point A for a moment and then stuck at point C for a moment. With hyperspace travel, that moment that you're stuck is maybe a quarter of that time. So it may limit you in terms of how you want to navigate around the universe, but it means really you're actually going to travel fairly fast uh, along the true routes in the universe. Wormhole travel is a little bit more different. Now, wormhole travel, you build a wormhole generator in your system. Now, this wormhole generator gives you an area of influence and allows your ship to essentially be transitioned via a wormhole to anywhere within the area of influence of your wormhole generator. So you can build, say, depending on the size of your galaxy, for example, 20 wormhole generators. And for your people to get around the universe, they'll have to transition via these 20 wormhole, tra uh, tra wormhole generators. But it does have a downside. Obviously, if you are at war and a warring nation decides to come along and destroys one of your wormhole generators, it means that you're going to have a hole in terms of where you want to try and jump to. So your network's going to be down until you get someone there to replace the wormhole generator or you put another one in another system. Um, but it does allow you to, to jump very big distances without much difficulty. Um, it just limits... It's great for later game for when you really need to get around the universe quickly, but when you're first establishing yourself in the galaxy, it does it is a little bit difficult because you're trying to get to every single system to survey it, to search if there's an inhabitable world there, uh, to make sure it's safe to go to. If not, you've it, it's difficult because if you go to a system that hasn't got a wormhole generator in, your only way back out of that system is to go back to the system that had the wormhole generator in. So you end up doing a lot of backtracking over the same system over and over again. But once you've done it once, if you never intend to go back to that system, you'll never go to that system again. So at least it has that benefit to it. Okay, last but not least is the ship appearance screen. Again, doesn't matter too much. This is completely dependent on your own personal feelings. Um, again, just because I'm a human race, for example, it doesn't mean I have to fly humanoid ships. I can fly avian ships, fungoid ships, erythropod ships. I can fly whatever type of ship that I like. So whatever I look at here, whatever takes my fancy, will be the type of ship that I fly. So for this time, I'm going to go plantoid ships. And there we go. That is the summary screen. It's a little bit out of date now, considering I started off saying I was a conservationist fungus. 
Um, and I've ended up being the Wheel Riker Brigade. But hey, this is just the summary of my species. I've decided that I'm going to be flying plantoid ships. I'm going to be firing red lasers and traveling via wormholes. I'm from Earth. I am, in fact, actually a fungus, fear me. Uh, and I am a fanatic purifying xenophobe. Uh, my subspecies is known as the Blood Court because of the types of combinations that I've taken. And that is me.